I'm Pat Metashevsky, and I am a uh, family advocate with lived experience and uh, also a registered nurse. And it's been a privilege to be on, on this commission, be with this group, and I want to thank you. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor. Mary Quay, I am here on behalf of Kathleen Verain from the Maryland Insurance Administration. Robin Ricard, the Executive Director of the Opioid Operational Command Center, and as well, very honored to participate in this. Thank you. I'm Lisa Burgess. I'm the Interim Deputy Secretary for the Facility Health Administration. I am a board certified adult child and resident psychiatrist. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening. I'm Trisha Roddy, and I'm the Deputy Medicaid Director for the Department of Health. Hi, I'm Richard Abbott. I'm Director of Juvenile Family Services for the Maryland Judiciary, and I represent the Judiciary and the Commission. Hi, I'm Dr. Linda Bineski. I'm a licensed psychologist. I'm the Director of Mental Health for the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. I'm Dr. Tripurnini. I'm a general psychiatrist by specialty. I'm an Associate Medical Director for Mid-Atlantic Kaiser Permanente. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Roland Butler. I am the Chief of the Field Operations Bureau for the Maryland State Police. Okay. Um, well, we have not finished the um, minutes at this point, so we will, uh, after we review them, we'll send them out electronically and ask for electronic approvals. Oh, um, do we have members coming in virtually? Uh, yes, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Oh, Christian. Hi, good afternoon. Yes, um, identify and yourself. Uh, Christian Mealy, um, Deputy Secretary with the Department of Disabilities and Youth and Family Subcommittee. Thank you. And good Hi. afternoon, Hi. Tiffany Rexford, representing the um, Department of Human Services. Okay. Hi, Lisa Fassett. Um, representing the Behavioral Health Administration, Office of Government Affairs and Communication. Hi, this is Angela Onime from Office of Government Affairs and Behavioral Health Administration. Okay. All right, thank you. I, as I just mentioned, um, the minutes will be provided. Um, at Recording in progress. Oh, we just started recording. Uh, in any of that, uh, will be provided uh, once we have completed the review. Um, okay, I'll turn to the subcommittee reports, uh, updates, and then why don't we start with youth and families. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Christian Mealy with the uh, Youth and Family Subcommittee. Uh, the Youth and Family Subcommittee uh, did meet last month, uh, and at that meeting, we highlighted both the state and national work that's uh, ongoing in this area. Um, the Maryland State Department of Education presented a deep dive at our last meeting of the Maryland Blueprint, um, specifically highlighting the school-based behavioral health initiatives that are ongoing. Um, a recording can be found on MSDE's uh, YouTube channel, if anyone's interested in, in seeing that. Um, to highlight one of the many programs, the Maryland Consortium on coordinated community supports is an initiative that will work to provide grants and technical assistance to schools that provide wraparound services for their students and staff. Um, the consortium right now is seeking public comment to guide its first year of work and also to help develop recommendations for the first round of grants. Um, public comment is requested to help define the kinds of activities that should be funded by the grants as well as ways to measure uh, programmatic success. They are asking that all comments be submitted no later than tomorrow, November 16th and a link to the form can be found on the consortium's website. Um, nationally, our subcommittee highlighted the HHS uh, roadmap to integration and specifically the Administration for Community Living or ACL announcement of the new funding opportunity to establish a national resource and technical assistance center for people with co-occurring intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as mental health disabilities. Um, the center's goal is to build state and local capacity to support those with IDD, and mental health disabilities, and um, also policy development. They'll do service design as well as coordination. 
and um, assist individuals, family members, and professionals with training, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and other resources. And um, our subcommittee is hopeful that this resource center will help Maryland um, better establish capacity to serve this population. Um, finally, we spent a majority of our meeting um, discussing the 2022 recommendations that we um, elevated to the full commission. Some of these recommendations include um, uh, the Maryland uh, Department of Health expanding the intensive home and community-based service array and access to the existing service array for youth. Uh, the second recommendation was um, that uh, MDH and BHA uh, would identify funding that could be used immediately to provide services to adolescents with substance use disorders assessed as needing uh, either 3.5 or 3.7 levels of care. Um, number three, the Maryland Department of Health should uh, develop and implement a public service, uh, sorry, a public awareness and training campaign to increase awareness and encourage the use of behavioral health advanced directives, uh, which have recently come online, uh, including both mental, and, uh, mental health and substance use. And finally, the Department of Health should annually release um, the public uh, behavioral health utilization data for youth and adolescent services. Um, if anyone needs more information about the ASAM criteria, feel free to let me know. Um, but other than that, on behalf of um, my co-chair, Tiffany Rexroad and Kirsten Rob McGrath, our uh, staff support from MDOD, we just wanted to really say what an honor it was to uh, be a part of this uh, wonderful commission. Uh, we want to thank the Lieutenant Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor, for your leadership and your stewardship and guidance throughout the years. And just all of the people throughout the state who are a part of this, uh, we really, it was a, a pleasure working uh, with everybody, both on our subcommittee and uh, on the full commission. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. And so I guess um, you'll be submitting those recommendations for the final report. Yep, we will. All right, thank you. Okay, finance and funding. Good afternoon, uh, yeah. Lieutenant Governor and other commission members. Um, uh, as usual, it, the finance subcommittee is co-hosted, um, chaired by myself and, and the MIA administration, and Mary Quay is here to give the update for MIA. Um, on the Medicaid side, um, uh, just to let you know, we did meet, the subcommittee did meet on November 7th. It was a very short meeting. Uh, again, we talked about a couple of things. First of all, um, we did give an update on system integration and the talks, again, for system integration have been focusing on uh, the Behavioral Health Administrative Service Organization, RFP, the request for proposal. Um, we gave just a quick update that it is our plans to have that um, released and um, posted by the end of the calendar year. Uh, and then secondly, we talked about um, the new services um, that the Medicaid program have been, have been working on for the past year and, and are, are our priorities to make sure that they um, get implemented um, in, the, in the near term. Um, so again, those three services are peer recovery specialists. Um, again, we're implementing that uh, with SUD providers uh, initially. Um, uh, the next phase, phase two, will eventually include mental health. But right now, we we have funding for the SUD providers. Um, secondly, we're uh, implementing mobile crisis services. Um, and then thirdly, uh, we're implementing crisis stabilization units. Um, so again, peer recovery specialists, our goal is to have that implemented um, by uh, April of next year and then uh, mobile crisis and crisis stabilization units by July of next year. So um, again, I was um, really proud of the BHA team as well as the Medicaid team on pulling these um, work groups together to develop the regulations, provider qualifications. Um, and it's, uh, it's very impressive what we're putting together just to give you a sense of how much funding has been allocated for these programs. It's uh, about 140 million per year. In, in behavioral health spending. So um, it's it's a very exciting time for the Medicaid program and the behavioral health program and the, and the stakeholders. So very good. thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to Mary. Thank you. Again, I'm Mary Quay. I'm the Associate Commissioner for Market Regulation and Professional Licensing at the MIA. As we have previously discussed, Section 15144 of the Insurance Article 
required carriers to file reports on their analysis of compliance with non-quantitative treatment limitations or NQTLs. And these are things like network adequacy, provider reimbursement, and prior authorization that may limit access to mental health treatment but aren't a direct quantitative limit. And the review of the reports has been detailed and complex. The MIA has sent the first letter to a carrier detailing the need for additional information and is close to finalizing a letter to a second carrier. And we have hired another contractual employee to review the filings, which should help with the process. Um, and these are very lengthy letters that go into a great deal of detail. The other topic of interest to this commission is the status of our regulations for network adequacy. We have been reviewing all comments and hope to have the proposed revisions submitted for publication soon. The big area of concern for this is telehealth and how to allow credit for telehealth. We continue to review the network access plans that carriers have filed for the prior year. And you may recall that the MIA entered into consent orders with some carriers who failed to meet standards in their 2019 network access filings. And the consent orders had penalties that were suspended to create incentives for future compliance. The MIA is now reviewing whether the carriers have complied so that the penalties remain suspended or have not complied so that we will be imposing those penalties. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, public safety and justice. Hi, um, I'm Linda Vanesky. I'm co-chair with uh, Senator Hester, who's off on a vacation. Well-deserved, I guess. Um, <laughs> We did not have a subcommittee meeting yet. Um, we skipped last month and hope to have one um, soon. But however, Senator Hester and I followed up with the Behavioral Health and Public Safety Center of Excellence. And since our last commission meeting, they have um, provided a train a trainer for 17 trainers for the um, sequential intercept model to help broaden um, through the counties. Um, that was based off the original um, um, SAMHSA grant that our subcommittee got for the 2020 SIMS summit that we had. Um, Jim Roden, the assistant director um, for the Center of Excellence, he coordinated a um, two-day um, summit again, and I attended yesterday and today. It was excellent. Um, they had no funds um, at all, and um, but somehow the, the, that team is working really well, and they've got, they got um, Dam Abram, who did the original um, statewide summit with us, and he came and volunteered his time. So it was excellent. Um, the staff coordinated. Um, they hope to get more funds, and I think one of the goals from our subcommittee should be helping them try to get um, funding to maintain this. They've partnered with um, the University of Maryland and um, to develop the strategic plan for the whole um, state. And they were there to present their beginning findings, and it was an excellent summit. They hope to have another um, train the trainer for this um, the sim model by uh, February. So um, I was really impressed. It's got a good team for that. So I think that was a great accomplishment getting that implemented. Have you been involved with um, any of the planning associated with the therapeutic treatment center in Baltimore? Um, yes. <laughs> I, I think I, I, I'm, I'm, I was told I wasn't supposed to talk about it, but since you're my boss's boss. Approved the design much. I think we can. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty involved with it since I'm the director of mental health. I, yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, we've talked about this before that, you know, a large percentage of the people who are, um, you know, and the facility have either or both mental health, substance use disorders, or that combination thereof. And so it made sense. And I, I go back to the prior Secretary of Public Safety and Corrections, uh, Moyer, who, you know, it was his idea that 
you know, rather than replacing the, the Baltimore City Jail with another jail, it should be more of a treatment facility. Yeah, I agree. So, well, I, I think it's going to, hopefully it'll be a model for the rest of the country uh, that, um, as we often say, the, I think the average, call it stay, the average stay at the facility is somewhere between four and six months. Um, you know, it, it can be you know longer if they're, they have a misdemeanor up to 18 months, but on average, it's turning over in that period of time. And so if many of those folks are right back on the street, and if they don't at least get some treatment and hopefully a warm handoff afterwards, uh, it, it may help some folks versus just kind of releasing and walking out on the street. I'm very excited about it. It's an excellent, and I, I, I'm because I started my career there at Baltimore City Detention Center, so I'm very excited because I think um, getting the community and wraparounds and also with the plan, I think is going to be tremendous. Good to hear. Not sure why they don't want to talk about it, but <laughs> <laughs> announced it at the Board of Public Works and talked about it before. At least I have so. Uh, crisis system advisory works. The governor, Mr. Faith will be on that. Uh, I will uh, discuss that on the agenda. You'll see that the department will highlight three other mm -hmm. areas of work: uh, maternal op opioid misuse program, uh, our mom that's in Medicaid, if you miss that. Uh, efforts involving our state hospital system and work addressing individual complex behavioral health conditions. But um, regarding the crisis system update. We want to thank all the community members and our stakeholders for working really hard uh, with us throughout uh, this time. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for all the support that you, you've given this work. Um, so we'll start the slides on the crisis system. You'll see that um, we'll cover just basically the work that's been done in the past couple of years. We'll talk a little bit about the outcomes. We know that that's important um, with the subcommittee and metrics, and then we'll um, briefly cover what we are looking forward to in the coming years. So if you could advance the slides, please, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So over the past uh, 20 years, we know that BHA has been providing um, funding to support the development uh, crisis system. We know this is not new work. Um, we often hear um, that we are putting together our pieces and making a more robust system. Uh, we currently have hotline coverage across the entire state through the 988 call line, as well as local hotlines. Um, there are 20 jurisdictions that currently have mobile crisis team services available. And funding has been provided to the four additional jurisdictions to develop these services. In addition to this, all mobile crisis teams are in the process of being trained in the mobile response stabilization model. And that's that model, the evidence-based one, that focuses on crisis responses for children, youth, and families. These teams are also being trained on the CAT or the crisis assessment tool. There are 16 walk-in or urgent care centers currently operational in Maryland. A resource guide has been developed and it will be shared with the public within the next month. BHA has received $1.94 million to support the recovery spe specialists in walk-in centers. Lastly, BHA has 254 residential crisis beds for mental health and substance use. Uh, these beds provide an opportunity for diversion or deflection um, for emergency department services or from emergency department services and our arrest. While we have a robust crisis system in place, we, we do acknowledge the work that uh, needs to be done uh, to continue developing a robust continuum of care. Next slide, please. <coughs> it's actually a national representation of the expectation of the outcome outcomes once you have a fully developed crisis system. I do want to bring people to the very first red um, line, and all the way to the right, you have um, system um, means that we can increase the chance of diverting patients from hospital criminal justice, but 
um, our um, partners in criminal justice are educating us about the word deflection. And so, so that I, um, I like that. But basically, if you see uh, from the left going to the right, you know, when a, this is the expectation that when a person falls, um, the crisis line individuals uh, who answer that call, but 80% of those calls can be resolved uh, simply with the call center. Of the remaining uh, individuals whose uh, difficulties are not resolved, um, mobile crisis are available. Uh, that's the goal for the um, state. Um, and uh, with the mobile crisis team, 70% of those um, difficulties uh, can be resolved. And then you have uh, the remaining uh, individuals. As you can see uh, virtually and think about it, the number of patients um, from the left to the right will uh, increasingly become smaller. But uh, with treatment with the crisis facilities, 65% um, of those can be discharged with the community. And if we uh, ensure that those individuals, um, when needed, have uh, wraparound services, that number increases to 65%. Um, you know, with the goal, of course, is to um, decrease the amount of patients, um, individuals that present to um, a higher level of service, the justice system, um, when it could have been avoided otherwise. I just want to note that um, all of this is a, a previous uh, slide of this traffic of a national representation. This is what we're planning on seeing in Maryland. And um, that leads us, thank you, to the next slide of outcomes. So these outcomes are some of the known evidence based ones um, via our, uh, based on SAMHSA Crisis Now and Mobile Response Stabilization Services. The Crisis Work Group has a data subcommittee and that is working with DHA to identify and define, uh, define key data elements and performance metrics to be included in a statewide crisis data system. The data subcommittee is currently working to further define the selected data elements from national and state sources and advise on strategies for capturing the data. High level specifications for a statewide data system has been developed and the department is in the process of securing funding for the data system and design and development work. Um, so please, you can advance to the final slide. So this slide is a representation of what we're looking um, forward. BHA uh, state partners and stakeholders are planning for the future. Well, uh, supported by this administration, which we appreciate, uh, Lieutenant Governor. Um, <laughs> It, but it needs to continue and it will continue. So in 2023, the state plan amendment um, via Medicaid will be submitted to CMS. Crisis regulations as Tricia uh, outlined for us already will be implemented in July. In 2024, we expect to support the development of additional regional and local crisis hubs, expand the care traffic control platform and then implement universal contract deliverables. This is designed to help measure outcomes consistently across the state. In 2025, we plan to implement a comprehensive data system. We want to track those performance measures, and we will have a new administrative services organization contract that work was missing, uh, supposed to be contract. Uh, and in 2026, the state will work for an all-payer participation. So thank you so much. Uh, we, we, we are appreciative of our other payers, payers um, uh, demonstrating their commitment uh, to this. And... Um, all this work is to demonstrate a reduction in the emergency department, inpatient, and criminal justice services. We will continue to build the integration of behavioral health and physical care across the state. And um, I just want to end um, this presentation by just saying that the overall strategic goal is to have a well-developed comprehensive crisis serving all people in Maryland in crisis across the lifespan. And that ends the Thank you. Now uh, you said there are 250 crisis. crisis. Oh, okay. I'm sure. I'm going to ask where, but that's all right. <laughs> I was going to ask where are they? But um, what's the time frame on the implementation of the crisis center, the regional crisis centers? I know we've, there's conversations about Western region might be the first. How far away from the first one? Oh, 
Well, we're going to work with my partners on this, but certainly we'll work with Chris Jig to um, work on that. Um, I know that uh, Trisha has pointed out we have a lot of funding going out mm -hmm. for that. Um, I don't have a specific date for this on your jurisdictions, but you're right. The goal is to ensure that the um, state is covered so we can have equity. Um, I'm looking at my partners with six regional areas. Six, I would. Six. six. Double check. Okay. And, and what we've what we've developed on the Medicaid program will be the reimbursement structure for both Medicaid and similar to how we organize other behavioral health services will be an uninsured a billing system as well. Right. So we'll cover both populations. Right. I have a question from Dr. Berg. So I was referring to the 254 residential crisis beds. Are all these for adults? Is this a combination of adults and adolescent beds too? That's a good question. I have to find out if some of them um, uh, include adolescents. I will tell you that what we're working with with adolescents, to your point, um, is, is to reflect what we know about adolescents. They do better when we do the intervention in their home um, ground. Right, so that's the MRSS model. Um, and so I'll get that information about any of this, the um, facilities accepting adolescents. Uh, but I do want to emphasize, um, and you know better than most, uh, that um, the children do better uh, when they are in the, the family um, setting. And the, the mobile crisis teams are being trained to ensure that not only they know about the MRSS model, know when to call and ask a specialist uh, around uh, who ask for um, clinicians uh, who are experts in the child space. What is the MRS? MRS? Thank you people so much. Yeah. <laughs> so it's mobile response and stabilization services. It's an evidence-based model that um, seeks to um, ensure that the approach um, to an individual in crisis, it happens to be a child and youth, um, receive services um, that take into account their special needs. Um, you know, you, you approach children and youth and adolescents different, differently than you would an adult. And you certainly want to ensure that you, um, I mean, I quite, I quite think, think that uh, when possible, you should have um, a significant individuals involved in, in care when the individual allows you to. But certainly that's important when you deal with youth. And so that's what this model ensures. I have a question as well. So Dr. Burgess, we had a um, presentation recently in the youth and family group. Um, and it, where one of the, one of the uh, recommendations was that children did better in school-based training or, or um, treatment, if you will. And because we work closely with the school systems, there's conflicts there and not in a negative way, but in the reality of the space that they have, in the reality of um, privacy, uh, in the reality that the schools have a liability. So if a student's on campus and has, for example, as Mary mentioned, a telehealth, um, who's qualified to help them if they have, uh, they're upset after that call. So there's a number of things in the school system. That, so I'm, I'd be interested to see how these come together over time. So, right, and as you know, there's a lot of work going on in that space. Um, and so I would say that um, if I could modify that statement a little bit about um, where an individual, a child or youth uh, best receive services, I would say since they are in school, then it's better to receive services there than send them to the ED. Oh, agreed. Right, so I know you know, but just yeah. in case, right? Um, and so... Um, there's robust conversations occurring around that um, um, around that subject, and and you're right. And and so um, uh, the entire department, including Medicaid and um, teams and public health teams and our teams, are somehow uh, involved because it, you're dealing with with the youth. Um, so um, this you know trending forward. Um, all of those um, topics, I'm sure, will will, will be um, brought forth when, when you have these stakeholders talk about what are we going to do we, um, with the um, advent of having um, school-based centers and um, wanting to place behavioral health assistance in those uh, environments. 
Yeah, because we get more and more treatment programs that are shutting down their youth-based um, programs because they can't afford, you know, they don't have the census necessarily or the insurance isn't providing it. So going to a private carrier, those options are getting more and more limited. So the whole system, I'll follow you. Um, just as a lay person, um, I, I get a little concerned about throwing more things into the school system. Uh, um, and I know they have to take children where they are. Um, so they're, they're, as you said, the, the privacy aspects, just the space, the physical space, and the, the human capital aspects of getting the pro providers or, or the uh, professionals that can be work in that school environment. So, um, yes, rather than shipping them off to the emergency departments, um, I just don't want to put that additional burden on the educator, the teacher that's not necessarily trained for that. And it's just it really gets very complicated how how they handle that that type of situation. And like I said, just putting that burden on the school systems, which some of our, and, and to be quite honest, some of our school systems struggle just in providing the basic services. Of, right. You know, reading, writing, and the third R. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just adding that to it is just, from the layman, I, I get concerned. Well, I think for me personally, it's educating the public as well. So they understand what's going on. I mean, we hear often, why doesn't the school do this? Why doesn't the school do that? Right. And they don't really comprehend the complexities, the legalities, the time, the spacing. Um, but, you know, so I agree. Help help them wherever we as close as wherever they are. But it it um, as the fire chief said to me recently, got to have the public as part of our solutions. Don't disagree. And he wasn't talking just about fire safety either. <laughs> No, it's everything. First responders, right? Yeah. Fire, police, and hospitals are twenty-four hour operations. Not a lot of others. I can speak to just your question about residential crisis beds. I don't think there are very many for youth anymore. There used to be more, um, but a lot of agencies had to close them down because the staff to client ratio was higher than with adults, but the rate was the same and so they were losing proposition mm -hmm. so a lot of those houses i know closed down over the last 20 years um so i don't think there are many left i know we have 24 beds and they're all for adults so it's a it's a challenge i mean but i agree and i agree i think it's if we can provide services in the home or in the school i do think that's better than certainly than the ed or sending them out of state yeah or sending them out of state so I don't know if there was ever an opportunity to have, because I do know that some families feel that a rest, some sort of respite is also helpful for some families. So I don't know what the options are. But. You say rate, are you talking? Medicaid, Medicaid rate. Right. Okay, not private insurance. Well, actually, recently, in the last couple of years, private insurance has started covering residential crisis services. We're credentialed with three. Um, we don't get a ton of referrals from them, but we are credentialed. So that, that's a new thing. Different rate for adults versus children. Out. I'm not sure, because I only had to negotiate the adult rate. Um, <laughs> yeah, but so that would be a question. I don't know. Um, so. Something we can look into. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the old news. But yeah, All right. can, if there's something we can happen now. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, a comment. Yeah, please. I just, uh, as a as a commission member, uh, I participated with the crisis subcommittee. Uh, that was the committee I was assigned to, and I just want everybody to know, um, and I've been around for quite a while, <laughs> that they did such a wonderful job. This was sort of in the beginning, and they laid the plans, uh, that they really got it organized and pulled together all of the service capacity of the crisis services that we have in 
whole state, which really, really helped us going forward. And it was such a great thing uh, to watch behavioral health and the OOCC work on that uh, together. And I really think that was the be beginning of a lot of success and that, that groundwork was laid. And um, I just really wanna compliment that group on, on doing that work. If only we, I, I shouldn't, I always say something <laughs> follow up, but it's negative. But if only the next thing we could do is really look at our service capacity for the other, for substance use treatment and mental health. What do we have out there? How many detoxes? How many outpatients? How many, I mean, I know we can get some of that from billing, but it would be nice to do that in the same way that they did it with uh, crisis services. I think they, they really created a model, uh, but I really saw this team um, that I don't always see. So I would just, uh, well, thank you both. <laughs> well, um, do this for us as we write the final report. That very point could be put in as a recommendation going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, that model crisis team did uh, the information together. Like you said, the information is out there. It's just it, it's it's data. It's not usable information. So other areas to have it in a simple fashion so that, you know, the policymakers of sheer and the have that information and that can be the groundwork for continuing this effort in those other areas. So you don't mind writing something up? Yeah, absolutely. And, Good idea. And sending it to us well. Yeah. In the right. And you have uh, presentations. We do. Um, so the first presentation uh, would be by Laura Goodman. Laura is executive director of the Office of Innovation, Research, and Development, the Medicaid program at the Mellon's Department of Health. Within Laura's role, she leads a team as project director of the Maryland of the Maternal Opioid Misuse, which is otherwise known as the MOM program. MOM is a key Medicaid intervention that supports both the maternal health and opioid goals under Maryland's statewide integrated health improvement strategy. strategies, Laura. Thank you so much, Dr. Burgess, and good afternoon, Lieutenant Governor and members of the commission. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to provide a brief overview of the maternal opioid misuse or MOM model. I'll present the current status of the program and the role of the upcoming MOM marketing campaign, uh, which will help us to achieve the model's aims. So in short, the MOM program in, provides enhanced case management services to a very specific and vulnerable population, and that is pregnant and postpartum Medicaid participants who have opioid use disorder. So under the program, MOM case managers work with participants to develop person-centered goals based on health-related social needs screenings, as well as clinical needs. So the model has been implemented on a limited pilot basis since July of 2021. Starting in January, just shortly, we're expanding it statewide. So to dovetail with the statewide expansion, the MOM team at the department will uh, implement a multi-pronged outreach strategy to increase the awareness um, and therefore participation in uh, the MOM program. So first, Providers such as uh, OB guides and primary care providers are an important source of referrals into the program. So we have been engaging with the medical societies that represent these groups in Maryland to strengthen those referral pathways. In addition, uh, we fund a group at the University of Maryland School of Medicine uh, called the Maryland Addiction Consultation Service, or MAX. Um, and they provide trainings and clinical supports to the providers who work with the mom population. Secondly, to generate community awareness, we are planning to hold educational sessions for community-based organizations. We are also funding Bowie State University, one of Maryland's four HB HCBUs, sorry, HBCUs, to uh, just conduct a study on cultural appropriateness of the model and adaptation of the model for communities of color. 
Lastly, and you can see a couple of examples here on my slide, we're about to launch a consumer facing social media and ad campaign with the aim of increasing awareness among potential participants for the mom program. So we will have paid placement through the end of this year and then be able to continue to use the imaging, images and messaging into the future. Um, so we thank you for the opportunity to provide this overview today and really to communicate to you all, you know, you're all very important and influential members of your communities. And we would very much appreciate your support in helping to amplify the messaging and helping us to get the word out about the mom program. Thank, thank you very much. The next two presentations will have the effort the kitchen the department has along with our partners to address um, individuals who need assistance in health care disposition, whether into a hospital or into the community. It will be presented by Brian Rose and Marshall Henson, respectively. Brian has, has had multiple roles uh, within the state of Maryland. Currently, he serves as the director of the MDH Health Care System. In this role, Brian and his team have worked tirelessly on managing internal and external efficiencies associated with the state system. This work also includes coordinating and collaborating closely with our judicial partners. Brian will highlight the work the department is doing associated with individuals who need community mental health placement, specifically uh, individuals in a hospital emergency department, uh, juveniles, uh, and, uh, adolescents with high risk um, behaviors and court ordered individuals. Following Brian will be Marshall Henson. Marshall is the first director of operations for the Behavioral Health Administration, and he has been in this role for a little over a year. However, he comes to the state with an extensive background in organizational and program leadership. Among the responsibilities in his portfolio is leading a discharge planning group that resolves placement issues those with complex behavioral health so with those introductions, uh, we'll lead off first with a presentation by Brian LaRose. Yes. Yeah, she used to come up here. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. <laughs> nice to see you again, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for the honor of presenting for you and uh, I was asked to uh, present on our three categories of individuals who need community mental health placements. Those are the individuals in the department, uh, juveniles with high risk, adolescents, and court ordered individuals. And that state of Marshall is taking care of the individuals uh, in the hospital emergency department. We're going to speak about the state hospital system and uh, what we've been experiencing uh, over since COVID. Um, so we've had a significant increase in our court ordered uh, referrals, which necessitated a new approach to managing the case. Many of you may or may not know, but we are under statute to set a requirement to admit court ordered uh, patients who are hospitalized within the 10 days. Prior to COVID, we were meeting that 10 day standard, um, averaging between three and five days. Uh, with the advent of COVID, hospital detention centers, community behavioral health providers all took extreme measures to halt the, the spread. But, and Maryland has recovered in many ways uh, from the various COVID-19 surges, but there are still lingering effects that continue to impact all of these systems. A nationwide sta uh, healthcare <clears throat> staffing shortage has increased the impact of operations of all healthcare facilities, including the state facilities. They also have impacted community placements to which court order committed patients are discharged. The wait list for admissions is merely a symptom of the greatly reduced throughput throughout the behavioral uh, health continuum. Staffing shortages in the spread of COVID-19 cases continue to impact our hospitals uh, and the ability to discharge individuals from state hospitals remains extremely challenging. At the same time that this was occurring, the number of patients committed to MDH by the courts has increased significantly with the reopening of the courts and the addition of mental health dockets. Because of all these challenges, the wait list for the admissions to the state hospitals has continued to grow. Over the past two years, even though the hospitals have been uh, open for admission since May 2020, the state psychiatric facilities are operating at capacity. Uh, every discharge, therefore, there is an admission waiting and scheduled to be uh, take that bed as soon as uh, the patient is discharged and it's executed safely 
uh, as quickly as we can and as safely as possible. Uh, we took several measures to address this growing demand for our hospital placements. Uh, in June 2021, we added 40 additional uh, acute psychiatric beds, in addition to beds that were created in the system uh, prior to COVID. Uh, we instituted several initiatives uh, to add more capacity to the community, to remove barriers to placements, facilitate discharges. Despite those efforts, the wait list continued to grow. Because of the ongoing crisis, Secretary Schrader established an incident command structure to address the barriers to the throughput and execute an entire system analysis to determine opportunities. This incident command is looking at every section of, our, uh, of the throughput, which includes prior to hospitalization, working with our courts on a regular basis, uh, looking at our internal processes, court uh, competency evaluations, and our healthcare uh, provided within our facilities, uh, and again, working with our community placements. Uh, next slide. Uh, this gives you an idea of the flow that we had gone through and looking at each opportunity uh, that we could really impact our system. Uh, as stated earlier, we have crisis, which is really looking at the uh, front end of the door, trying to help people before they get into the judicial system at all. Uh, and that would really be our primary goal. Um, but for those that are involved, uh, we have taken steps uh, with the courts to meet with them, and uh, update them on our activities on a regular and ongoing basis. We work with our police departments and our department, uh, DPSCS, um, to encourage uh, police diversion and deflections into our community crisis centers. We have looked at our competency evaluations and knowing that people are in detention centers who are waiting to get into our state hospitals. We have provided psychiatric consultation services to the detention centers for patients who are awaiting admission. We've looked at our facilities across the board and streamlined admissions where we could. Um, and again, we work with our DPS counterparts to expedite those admission, uh, clearing all sorts of testing and all uh, processes that we could. We've really expedited uh, the admissions process. Uh, we work with our DPS yes, uh, counterparts on a daily basis, and we establish a clinical algorithm so that those at court orders that have the highest clinical need uh, could get admitted as quickly as possible while still being aware of the length of wait time. This has allowed us to immediately fill a bed as soon as one becomes available. Um, and as we've gone through this list, I'd like you to look at the screen on yours. It's a kind of a bluish or purple in the corner. As we looked at our system analysis, we found that our largest opportunity is actually patients who are at our hospitals who are waiting to get into the community. Um, to give you an idea of that perspective, our current wait list to get into the state hospital system is 135. Those patients who are in our hospital system who are ready to go and looking for community placements is 171. If we could facilitate that process, that would really balance out our wait list. So we really think this is our greatest opportunity for growth. We work closely with our partners, closely, closely with BHA. Uh, I work in operations as the Department of Health, but we work closely with them to look at every opportunity. Um, that 170 on that list were broken down uh, into each one of their clinical compartments because they're not one big group. Each one of those have individual needs of where they might be going, where they might be placed, <clears throat> and uh, what their court order involved in. Um, so we established a multitude of initiatives to bring resources to those individuals, and we began looking at the uh, opportunities in the community itself. We met with stakeholders to establish and support the opening of new beds in the community and to realign beds in the community to meet the needs of state placements. The community placements like the hospitals have also been impacted by staffing shortages. We continue our work with these community partners and stakeholders. We have increased our funding and, uh, and use of the uh, assisted living units, a program which has been very successful in placing our patients for discharge. We've also focused on a capitation program, which required significant clinical improvement, and we work with our uh, providers to meet the uh, state standards and requirements. And I'm happy to say they have, and we've been utilizing uh, capitation uh, more and more. We've um, also realigned our, our, our RRP beds, which uh, that were not being used into useful beds. And we continue to explore every opportunity. One of the opportunities that we find coming up next is our, um, uh, it is uh, the most available on both the back end, helping people get into the out of the hospitals and into community placements, but 
also in prevention is housing. So we've been working with the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, to look at areas where we could um, find a, a, a nexus point between our state hospital systems and discharge planning community and this hospital program and this uh, housing program. I can stop there before I go on to juveniles. Yeah, so, <laughs> just a question. When you said you have 180, I think, ready for discharge, mm -hmm. you're looking for community placements. What type of placement is this? Is this involuntary committals or is it outpatient or what is? So it's it whole So it would be independent living, it would be assisted living, it would be RRPs, it would be capitation programs. Um, it would be nursing homes. All of those are where our patients could go. Those, some of those were fruit involvements. And again, if you look at the uh, bottom of our the, the purple area again, um, the top two boxes, the civil and voluntary patients are one group. And then the bottom two areas are the incompetence and trial group um, that have gone through our hospital system and the NCR, which have also gone through our hospital system and ready for discharge. Such a So... I guess. So some of those would still be court involved. Okay. If they went into these programs, yes. Right. Okay. But as a provider, I can speak that the when we RRP is what Cornerstone Montgomery has. We're one of those programs, and um, certainly the push always has been. I mean, since I've been working with RRP for a long time. Um, and it's as in the legend that's residential. Residential rehab, yes. Yeah, so it's housing with services included, and so. There's intensive in general, just the supervision level. And many of the hospital folks, when they come out, they need the intensive level supervision. So anytime we have, a, especially our 24 hour beds, they want the state, or you know, when we ask for a referral from the county, we often get someone from the state, um, from the state hospitals that to be referred out back into the community. And so we interview them and you know, do the, the whole process. I will say that. You know, it's a challenge, and I'm sure the hospital experiences the same thing. Some of the clients, once they meet and go out, they don't want to be discharged. They don't want to go into the community. Sometimes we find they're not ready to go into the community. Um, there's concerns when they do a visit kind of thing. So it's it's a challenge on so many levels, because I know you've got the push from behind the scenes to the waiting list and then the people that are in the hospitals who you don't want them to be there for forever. But it's it's definitely, it's a tough I just know when we do the intakes, we're never sure. We're like, are they really ready? Are they not ready? And some have to end up going back, and some are successful. And sometimes you can't tell from an intake and a visit. But it's definitely an important piece, and I know RRP prioritizes. Okay. Now I know that these are elementary questions, but um, when you're taking a person in, are you taking them in a residential? using residential beds, mm -hmm. they're staying there for some period of time, yes. is that they will eventually go out into the... Well, so I will say when I first started working in residential, it was, they, clients were told, this is, you come and this is a transitional opportunity. Right. I can say that most everyone in this room now knows that I, I have worked with people who have been, who are still in that residential program that I was in starting 32 years ago. So people do stay, for a long time because they can't go out on their own. They need that support. Now they move from intensive to general, that kind of thing. They get more independent and we, we urge people to move out. But I'm telling you, that's getting harder and harder. The people that we're seeing are more challenging, have more multiple issues, the medical side of things. I mean, everyone in this room knows it. get older. But... Yeah, and right, well, and people are aging in place. I mean, right, it, people are aging in place. A, you know, ALFs don't want, you know, assisted living facilities don't want our clients, so they stay. So it's a, just a challenge across the board of where people can go because of the needs are so extreme. And if they're coming from the state hospital, we generally, they're generally referred to the 24 hour intensive. And it's, it's just, it's just tough. It's a tough situation because um, the needs are so high and it's hard for, we need to move more people out of residential to bring in more. And that's even challenging because we have clients who they're not ready to move out on their own. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a tough whole situation. Is this also related to the fact that they have both disorders? No, no, not not for us anyway, because we take, we have a program, we have residential beds for both disorders. Now, maybe other agencies can't handle both mental health and substance use, but we have a specialized program that does. So, and actually all of our, 
Yeah, the complexities is more the medical. It's medical, mm -hmm. the complicating medical issues, as well as sometimes also the co-occurring substance use disorder for uh, for the RRP. We think and not think that everybody can go to the community. Right. I think that's, that's the problem. Yeah. Well, that's part of it. I mean, I just know when I worked, I also worked in capitation. I was my, you know, right out of graduate school. It was an amazing experience. It's a wonderful program. The fund, I love the funding model. I'd do it myself in a hot second. And we took people from the state hospitals when they first opened, they were taking people from Springfield there for 30 and 40 years. And they were successful. Many of them were successful coming out in the community with the supports we had in place. But there were a handful, and it was not very many, who we, reached, we sent back to the hospital. One of them was an 85-year-old woman who threw chairs at me. We said, you know what? Maybe you need to go back to the hospital. I mean, there were other issues, but... So it was a handful that had to go back. Most who'd been there for years were able to. I think the population shift. Yes, I, I agree. Severity. Yes. Uh, um, because basically the diversion isn't working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the state hospital isn't working for me. And they're ending up in prison. Yes. So then when they get time out, we can't get those beds. Right. <laughs> that we need. Right. So. And maybe we all need to rethink that not everybody belongs in the community and they need a higher structure, not prison, but a higher structure of care. No, I mean, I, you, I believe you've all heard me say just from my non professional is that we threw the baby out with the bathwater mm -hmm. when we shut down all the facilities. Yes. Yes, they were warehousing, there were problems with a lot of the facilities. Uh, but there are some people who can't take care of themselves mm -hmm. and they just. Correct are in such a severe situation <laughs> cannot be in the communities. The car, the society. So, you know, that yeah. no one's going to take them and we have the, that problem. And no one seems to want to really go into, as we saw here, uh, no one really wants to fight that fight. We know our legislature doesn't want to deal with it. Um, I had a conversation with a, a United States Senator who didn't want to deal with it, and our Congressperson who didn't want to deal with it. So they just act like, oh, well, you know, it's not my committee. Oh, it's not, you know, even though they'll they'll say they've had constituents call about this very same issue, they don't want to deal with it. Um, so. Because it costs money. It costs hard. money, and, what do you, you know, their, their campaign contributors aren't talking about it, so be quite honest about it one is they don't see a benefit to themselves i'm talking about political folks they don't see a benefit to themselves in taking care of this they're you know they like their little positions of quote unquote authority and they don't want to step into areas that are more difficult no I'll agree with that mm-hmm and thank you, thank you for your comments. Uh, thank you for your work. <laughs> yeah. Together with it's a it's a challenge. I know for the hospitals too. Maybe we need a step down program from the hospitals. Be one. I don't know if it's still there. Yeah. No. <laughs> Second lane. That's one of our uh, programs that we're working with. Mm. Second. Well, that's cool. Lots of initiatives. All of us. All right, uh, I would also like to present more of our work on the juvenile high-risk adolescents. Uh, I want to state ahead of time that uh, for the majority of our, our adolescents, the system works well. We have lots of kids who go through our GC system. Lots of people go through hospitals. Lots to go through um, our, our foster care system. Uh, we are talking about a small number of kids, but no matter how small the number it is, one kid that's suffering is, is too many. So I agree with that, but I, I, I love to give accolades to our partners who are really working hard. A lot of other agencies provide care. Um, the, uh, in a meeting with three secretaries of DJF, DHS, and uh, MBH, uh, there was a, a look at our RTC system for the unit uh, beginning of January. Uh, that RTC uh, system was looking to shore up our system because we had uh, had a lot of RTCs closed yep. over the past 10 years. Uh, we did not want to see any more beds lost and we wanted to ensure there was capacity in the system. So we established an RTC work group, which included DJS, DHS, and MDH, and met with those providers. Uh, we wanted how we could make sure that they remained in quality of care, remained high, and that the children were getting uh, all the care they needed in a safe way. 
Uh, we were able to get them in through discussions, but then they were not initially given the eligibility relief. But through efforts, uh, the administration gave them uh, was able to award them seven point eight million dollars, which really shorted up their business model because they were deeply impacted uh, by COVID. Uh, also, in the past year, we've been able to increase their daily rate. Um, I think it was five fifty, and you can correct me now. It's seven eighty. <laughs> 770 <laughs> in there. Uh, and we've also been able to create a tiered rate system for the high intensity youth. Um, that is where our RTC system, but as we went through this, we realized this is residential treatment and center. I okay. should also explain this. So I apologize. Thank you. Residential treatment center. Um, then uh, in looking at the, the youth on these lists, we uh, noticed there were youth in, oh, we're not noticed, there was a long standing issue of uh, hospital overstays. Uh, working with our partners at the uh, DHS, uh, we began intensive work with them. Uh, I meet with uh, my counterpart at DHS, so we meet with DHS you know, on a daily basis to look at any suit, any uh, youth that are in a hospital overstay that are under DHS care. Um, I can readily report that uh, when we started the list in the 19, the last Friday, there were only four on that list. Three of them already had identified placements. And one was fairly new to that list. So we've had tremendous success in our DHS um, uh, youth that were in an overstay. Um, we also started looking at the youth that were not just DHS, but also youth in the school system. And I'll let Marshall come up next to talk about that. <clears throat> um, Marshall and I also work very closely on those programs. Um, we meet daily with uh, MDH and DHS. We meet weekly with MDH, DHS, DJS, and MSDE, all of those departments, uh, to really look at our list of children who are in hospitals and overstays and figure out what resources they need and how can we that meet their needs. Um, and uh, uh, we also report out weekly to the three secretaries on our work. Um, I also meet monthly with the providers and the RTC providers, and also meet with the hospital systems as we address this issue. So we are aware of uh, the hospital overstays. We've been addressing it we've had some success in the, uh, particularly in the overlap between those that are in DHS and overstays. We're working very diligently to address the rest of those. Just wanted to update you on that. Yes. I have a question, and I'm going to go for an ignorant question, but maybe not. Um, so we've seen in the paper recently about overstays in the in the general hospitals, not in state hospitals. Uh, is that what you're referring to? So or or not? And that, uh, um, juveniles and, and youth. So that would be for the uh, private hospitals. Um, and we're also looking at RTC overstays. Anybody okay. that's in an RTC and anybody that's in a ED or inpatient. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to turn it over to Marshall. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Can you think everybody hear me okay? Yep. Great. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate the um, conversation that we just had about. Um, Exceptional uh, Much of my role has been for now is I know that this group knows the, the structures of the behavioral health system as well, but it's always a good reminder. Within behavioral health, um, it is it is very much a journey talking about building a city, right? So it's it's not um, the same as, as building a building where once you finish the building, you can say there's there's the building that's done. Um, it is a, a journey that we're we're on over time. And so we have um, really been looking at the system that we've had in place. Uh, but then post COVID, what the systems need to look like. And, and this group has been very much involved in that development. So, 
We've been looking largely at the hospital overstay population, the challenging, uh, hard to serve adolescent population. We started down this path about 18 months ago when we started looking at House Bill 1121 and the Vet Registry and Referral System. And so I'm going to start here um, a little bit at the end or the present of where we're at now, back through the process of how we came to these. Um, but I want to start here. So you can see at the beginning, um, what we have learned is that visibility into open that rights around the state is, is absolutely so What do I mean by that? Particularly when we're talking about inpatient psychiatric beds. Where are those beds um, located around the state? Uh, where are the open beds? And more importantly, where are the staff? And what are the uniquenesses of those beds? Is it for older adult populations? Is it for the child population? Where can we specific potential in solving uh, the hard to serve adolescent population challenge? Uh, the second finding is the, the need, the um, essence of care coordination. And what I mean by that is really looking at the barriers that individuals are facing to receive services. So uh, as an individual might um, land in an emergency department, uh, the moment you start looking at barriers and you add additional barriers on, what are the options you have? So the moment you add in a complex uh, custody arrangement, uh, a guardianship issue, an uninsured population, you start limiting your options for placements. <clears throat> um, also, one of our findings over the course of the first 18 months is that level of acuity matters looking at challenging patient population. So when we're looking at developing public behavioral health services, we of course are looking to develop those services to serve as many people as possible. But the higher level of acuity that you have, the more limited your options of placement. And so it gets back to the idea of the, of the exceptional need. So, uh, for instance, if you add in aggression to a level of acuity, the patient lands in an emergency department, you will solve the um, medical issues around that patient. And you recognize that there's a need for further behavioral health treatment, but you're also dealing with aggression. Um, and so you start looking at, at your options and who's going to be able to serve that patient. What we often see is that op your options are narrowed as soon as you uh, see that issue of aggression. So we may have an opening in a psychiatric uh, hospital. Um, but we don't always, um, we're not always able to access that bed because of the level of community, particularly as it relates to depression. And then the last piece um, that I want to highlight and then I'll get into is that exceptional cases require exceptional resources. So again, we develop systems to serve broad groups of people, but we're going to have to look to serve those exceptional The next slide, um, So when I came into the organization, Secretary Schrader um, had, had approached me about the bed registry of the school office and how to build one more I really wanted to operationalize. What he said was, while this is pointing to the technological system, we need to implement a technological system to help improve the development of the system. We really need to understand what the operational barriers are before we implement it. So we started down that path. And what we looked at said this last, um, this past February, we had the uh, Omicron COVID. And we were having a lot of people hitting the emergency departments. A lot of those were behavioral health patients getting stuck in the emergency departments. And 
causing quite a bit, a bit of challenges for the hospitals being able to triage other COVID patients uh, because they don't know it's longer. And we heard from the hospitals very clearly, we need more behavioral health beds. We need more behavioral health beds. And we said, well, maybe, but we might also need to know where the existing beds are that are open and staff that can be referred to. So the normal routine practice in uh, hospitals for discharge planners is to when you need an uh, inpatient bed is to pick up the phone, call the other hospitals, and see if they have an open inpatient psychiatric bed for the client that you're serving. It's like throwing darts in the dark, right? You don't have to the uh, dark. So we quickly stood up a uh, an inpatient psychiatric bed for it that showed availability across the state to those open beds. So the discharge planners could immediately look and see, for instance, Johns Hopkins uh, downtown has eight beds uh, for adults uh, for inpatient psychiatric care. Um, or University of Maryland Medical Center um, has four uh, open beds for adolescents. We could immediately begin helping with that um, patient flow to those beds. So while we recognize that there may be a need for additional beds, what we recognized was more important is we needed to know where the open beds were so that we could affect that patient. Um, so as we started going through this process, um, we recognized that issue of care coordination, right? And so we uh, began very quickly looking at how can we put in a system that allows for that care coordination. So we implemented uh, a two-on-one uh, going off here. Just in July, we implemented a two-on-one building off of Maryland's successful two-on-one system over time. This gives discharge planning in hospitals an opportunity to call in the two-on-one test for register the patient who needs community-based behavioral health services. And we've coupled that with the state level team that can provide some of that critical So imagine you're a discharge planner in a Hospital, you call in the 211 test score. 211 can begin doing their assessment and their triage to refer you to resources where necessary. I'm sorry. Um, and who does the triage? I'm sorry. Who does the triage? Great question. So when you call in to 211 press 4, it is a care coordinator staff by 211. They um, take the information and they also run through their assessment protocols, which they have run some of our customers through the state of Maryland. So go through their assessment protocols and they'll also access our, our research data. So once they've determined what the level of service is needed, they're able to access the resource database and that which is well as the If that doesn't solve the problem, then they can escalate that to the state level. So, so the state level team is part of MDH? That's right. So the state level team is a part of MDH. Also, the clues we have brought in the Department of Human Services into the equation. We have also included the uh, Development Disabilities uh, Administration, uh, as well as the Department of Juvenile Services. Well, we know that some of these are overly complex given the barriers. So, are they licensed uh, clinicians that are so triaging? The individuals that are operating the 211 lines are um, trained, they're not licensed physicians, so they are typically taking the recommendations that come from the hospitals and working with those recommendations to look at the resources that exist. But they're, they're really not making assessment, doing assessments. Not in the medical sense, you're right. So they're assessing the situation based on the 
healthcare needed to come to the hospital. Mm -hmm. so, you know, um, this is why I was talking about service capacity earlier, because um, I'm not really, sh I, I think we have resources that we're really not utilizing and some that we could have that would be easy, such as our own ACT teams, you know, that one thing comes to mind that could take some of this, um, you know, overload. And uh, also CCVHCs um, that we haven't been able to, for some reason to uh, get them started here in Maryland. But there, there are those pieces too, that I think could really help with this. Yeah, I mean, CCBHCs include everything that we've talked about today. All the crisis, the partnering with jails, with schools, with juvenile services, with hospitals, with police. I mean, so I think, I don't know, I feel the same. It's a better way to pool the resources instead of dividing them up everywhere. I don't know. It's a great point. In many situations, it's a matter of knowing where the resources are. Right. Right. So even just since we've implemented the 211 system, the numbers of calls that have come in to register patients in over states, over 50% of the, the call cases have been able to be resolved by the 211 system. Right. So they've been able to access the resource database. Make the referral with the discharge planner. The discharge planner works with the patient to achieve that that placement, um, and we track that through the, the system. In less than half the cases, they have to be escalated to our state team, and so that was something that we we didn't anticipate. Right, that many of the resources are there. Discharge planners and hospitals aren't always aware of the various uh, behavioral health resources. So just by having that care coordination model in place, you're giving access to resources that folks may not be aware of. The other piece of that is on the inpatient side, right? So we um, track emergency department orders. Um, anyone who's um, been in an emergency department uh, past medical necessity and needs behavioral health services. And we've tracked that now for the past five or six months. And on a daily basis, we see about 100 uh, emergency department orders. But we also now are able to track and see uh, how many inpatient psychiatric beds we're visiting across the state. And we see about 150 plus uh, inpatient psychiatric beds available on a daily basis. So you can see that the capacity exceeds uh, the need, uh, but it's a matter of knowing where those open beds are and also helping discharge planners in the hospitals connect with where those open beds are. When we implemented this 211 system and we implemented the inpatient um, psychiatric bed ward, the bed locator. That was the first time the state had this resource where you could see the open available, that capacity issue to be able to make those timely referrals and folks needing these resources. So I would, I would thoroughly agree. Sometimes it's a matter of just knowing where the capacity is and letting people know how to access that, that existing capacity. Uh, I have a one. You mentioned, Marshall, when um, pre 211 Press 4 went into play, and I missed it. July 1 of this year. Okay, and I'll just make a general comment. Everything we hear from people on the street, if you will, people that need, uh, just everybody's desperate for where do they go. And I recognize it's a challenge because there's a lot of resourcing, but yeah, good to know 211. Press one, press four works for hospitals. For hospitals. Were all the hospitals educated on this then? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, I'd say no. Number one, so we started the launch for 211 plus four in June. The very targeted of the hospitals. 
they want to get the process down, they want to get the methodology down before we roll out to the rest of the state. So we rolled out to the rest of the state as of October 11th. Um, so all of the hospitals are actively being trained, but they're actively being trained on the online portals, the web based system that we set up. The two on one press four is open to every hospital right now. You don't need training on it. All you have to do if you're a hospital discharge planner, you're not that. They will immediately help you with the research. But the beauty of um, question on this side of the table is the public access. So not only do we have the two on one press four option to discharge planners. But we've also set up a resource directory that's public facing through two line lines that we can provide the link to the group. But it, it's an online searchable database of all the behavioral health resources. And it's searchable. So you can uh, go in, you can enter your zip code, the type of service that you're looking for. You can your information if you want to get that specific language preferences, if you want to get further specific, and you'll come up with a list of behavioral health resources that are in that, that group. So, again, to get into the capacity of access and knowledge of, of what's out there. So, again, that's a resource specific that wasn't had prior to this. And where is that? That is uh, 211. .com. Uh, this might not be related, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and you can just tell me it's not related. But I'm listening to this accessibility, and I'm thinking about GBRICs and other systems, and, and how and if are these being in integrated or planned to be? Question mark. Yes, question mark. It's a great question. Okay. <laughs> uh, can you define GBRICs? I'm sorry. GBRICs, is what you said? Yeah, it, I can't ever remember what the... Greater, greater resource it's it's the grants that are coming from the hospital right. um, in order to set up some of these crisis services okay. in the meantime while we're working on a payment model for medicaid and behavioral health so they've been set up across the state so there are three um, regional examples of yeah. right across the state but we shot rates and different flavors uh, but really focused on crisis system how that plays into this is um, those efforts are still going on within crisis systems. Um, this is taking an added layer on top of that. So when we're really looking at that care coordination for the most challenging cases, for the exceptional cases, this gives um, an additional resource to do that. And specifically geared towards Hospital, emergency departments, and uh, so while GBRIX is looking at the entire community focused around the Baltimore area, this is utilized with the Texas being the hospital site, so solving some of the patient flow uh, from the emergency department as well as from the emergency I believe we have the um, two on one model on the next there. And I have talked um, to the units quite a bit because we all have to spend too much time on it. But what I will, what you will see here is basically the patient flow as soon as a discharge plan in a hospital recognizes the need, right? So if you're a business planner in a hospital, you um, don't have options for the behavioral health system. You need to call and uh, access the system. We do a needs assessment based on the clinical judgment of the hospital. Um, resource options are identified and communicated, then the patient is referred and placed. And our 211 team tracks our patients all the way through that disposition to make sure that follow through has occurred. 
Um, and so this also gives us a mechanism over time to look at trends and capacity issues. Right? So where did patients go most often? We need the services coming. Um, where did we not have enough services? And so that gives us some tendons and benchmarks. And as I mentioned um, before, we set up a whole state level team beyond just the two running on the floor. It is an interagency team. In these cases, the two on one cannot solve. That gets escalated to the state level too. For me, as the state administration, we start working with the Department of Human Services. We reach out to the local care team to reach the jurisdiction. We reach out to the Department of Social Services offices, as well as to the behavioral health provider network, we need to get to a resolution. Again, that's a resource that never existed before the one It's the ability for these complex cases to move through a layer of two on one care coordination. And then, if it can't be resolved at that level, to escalate to a dedicated state level to comes to work every day just solving these complex issues. Next slide, please. So I want to talk just a little bit about um, tertiary care and this idea of tertiary care within the realm of behavioral health equity. Right? We've all talked about behavioral health equity uh, frequently and many perspectives. And I want to talk about it from the perspective of uh, behavioral health matching uh, somatic care or physical medicine. So if you think about it um, from a very tangible example, right? so if you, um, you have a primary care physician, um, your primary care physician can handle a lot of things, but if you need heart surgery, you wouldn't want your, your primary care physician handling your, your open heart surgery. You want to go to a special tertiary uh, level specialist. Um, I also bring the point home. My, my wife is a NICU doctor, and in the state of Maryland, we have level one, two, three, and four NICU uh, neonatal ICU care units, right? And um, you can imagine the need for those. Most of our community-based hospitals um, go up to level two and level three neonatal care. Uh, and they can't solve it, and they toss it up to the level four neonatal ICU. We don't have that same level of care within behavioral health. So if you look at our inpatient psychiatric care units in our hospitals across the state, we don't have that same specialization, that tiered approach. So what you often get to is that tertiary or primary group uh, was left out of the equation um, or is refused for service. So back to my initial point of once you increase that level of acuity, your options for care become limited. So that's a discussion that we've started introducing within Maryland, but that need to, to bring some equity between behavioral health and somatic care. So I think we'll be doing uh, more of that as we move forward. Um, so the last thing I want to point to that maybe is the tertiary care idea and how we've been approaching it from an expansion perspective, and maybe a, a part of our model to be forward. So as Brian just talked about, we have enhanced rates um, within our residential treatment centers to match that tiered system, to match that level of community, recognizing that not all patients needing residential treatment care services are the same. Uh, and so how do we adjust our model? Both from a care perspective, but also a rate reviewers. Um, we have implemented an adolescent hospital overstay grant program with a couple of providers that are really targeted on folks that are getting stuck in the emergency departments where there are no other options for these individuals. 
Uh, we are undergoing the process of implementing a crisis stabilization and short term residential care unit for this high acuity population. So that's something that we're doing online within the next month or so. And we've also, because we've set up this state level care coordination team, we're now able to look at exceptional compensation for complex cases. So we're able to evaluate those needs. We're able to negotiate with individual providers um, who may need additional um, financial resources to help with facility adjustments, help with additional staffing, whatever the need may be to serve um, those really challenging parts of the population. Um, we have our specialty population providers expanding their services as well. Uh, Brooke Wayne, Jeff McGrath, um, Johns Hopkins, Kennedy Krieger Institute, um, many who have been expanding in the field of neuropsychiatry. And the last piece that I want to finish on is um, what we've really been intensely focused on, which is utilization. This is um, uh, probably a new concept for many, but not all. And this is managing the entire patient flow so that we have an effective public behavioral health system that really allows us to access that capacity base. So as we look at clients moving from one service to the next, making sure that they don't get stuck and be part of that service along the way and can continue to move to the next um, public service next so um, an example, right, that you had of, of um, a client staying for 32 years in the service, absolutely necessary for that client. We wouldn't want to see that um, for every client um, because we wouldn't be able to access um, this for clients. So it's a way that we can restructurally look at some of the um, bases within the public behavioral health um, and offer some solutions along the way to help them move to a lower level of care um, and a more integrated level of care. So we're looking strongly at um, how to introduce additional levels of utilization benefits. So we can really think about the capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is this is really wonderful. Um, I really think that the way that we reimburse right now so fragmented. It was good to hear you say, you know, that you can pick up those pieces. Uh, I think that's what you were saying, and um, that it drives poor care. You know, when you when the reimbursement system is the way it is. So I, I think this is an attempt to, you know, look at that, which I think is great. Well, I'll end with that piece. You know, we, we have an, an understanding of, of the, the challenges that um, are in front of us right now, but we need to remember uh, and looking at those um, great methodologies. Thank you all. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Great. I have a question to Laura Goodman, who presented the mom program. If she's oh. still online. Yes, right. Laura Goodman still on. She might have gotten off. Okay. Um, it, Maybe I can make a comment and a yes. question. Uh, I want to really thank the Medicaid Office of Innovation for launching the program, which is well needed. It's a wonderful program. There is extensive literature course. Early intervention actually prevents stillbirths. Most importantly, increasing the premature deliveries that leads to a higher rate of neonatal intensive care unit admissions that costs a lot of money because right. neonatal with viral symptoms and other morbidity. And there's also data that shows the return on investment on this program is more than tenfold. 
more than tenfold because it decreases the MICU days. My question to Laura, or whoever in that program would be, since the pilot program has been launched, uh, what is the participation rate and was there any outcome data that they have been tracking? So I will say um, it's in St. Mary's County. Um, the participation rate is low just because of the county that was selected. <laughs> um, it's very small. So I, I don't know the um, if we have any significant outcomes to share with you at this point. But the good thing is, is that January 1st, it will go statewide. So we're really very excited about it and agree with you in terms of, you know, what the research shows in terms of the high intense case management of the of this population and what it can deliver in terms of outcomes. You have a centralized number that we are in uh, the calls can come in so that the case managers can be assigned. It's uh, the state. Well, it's um, operated through our managed care organizations, and they develop the relationships and the case managers within each county. It would save a lot of money <laughs> if it's fully launched and fully executed the right way. Okay. Well, we'll definitely reach out to you and, and get your input. Thank you. Yeah, I thank everyone for that. Brian Marshall, um, uh, Laura, who's off now. Uh, but thanks for that uh, presentation. Okay, we'll turn to now uh, public testimony. Um, and so Evelyn Burton had signed up. I guess you, Evelyn, are you online? Okay. And I don't know if everyone's together or these individuals. Sabrina Lassiti, Lassiki? Hi, are you signed up to speak? Yes. Okay. Can you come to the podium? Hi, uh, I'm Sabrina Lissang. I currently serve as Ms. Bethesda. Um, I'm a 21 year old filmmaker, business woman, actress, print model, pageant girl, TikToker, and actor today, political and social justice advocate. Today, I am here to speak about the strain of silent suffering, the importance of resources for survivors of sexual assault and survivor mental health. I was 15 years old when I was brutally raped and left for dead by three boys in my hometown here in Maryland and covered in bruises and burns in places that were not designed for such destruction. I felt extremely ashamed and mortified speaking up about my experience. After the destruction of my rape kit, which is not something that should have been curated so easily, I felt like the little girl who cried wolf that no one would believe. Thankfully, in the past six years, we've overturned such a reality with the Survivor's Bill of Rights, a bill Congress unanimously voted on. And after a long journey of healing, I'm finally able to say, my name is Brittany Lissay, and I am a survivor of sexual assault. Today I stand before you, a 21 years old, changed woman, and I am not humiliated to share what I went through. My traumatic experience may make many uncomfortable, but in order to move forward and evoke change, we need to learn to exist in uncomfortable spaces. I've worked and volunteered over the past few years with organizations like Rise Now, Thorn, Polaris, Train, and the In and Out Children's Foundation. At my production company, we use Film Forum to inform and create narrative films to raise awareness on sexual assault, sex trafficking, and domestic abuse, and the increase in mental health that comes. Today, I stand before you to speak on behalf of survivors everywhere as your united lead site. Today, I am requesting the Mental Health Committee's support in what I am calling the Survivor Screening Act. An act that allows for individuals who have been assaulted the opportunity to enter a courtroom remotely and testify. As well as a program called We Are the Rising Youth, aka Wary. This was started by me and my peers here in the DMV area, and it works to encourage healing through various activities such as art, filmmaking, boxing, dance, poetry, writing, and more, while educating high school students on their options if ever sexually assaulted. Earlier this year, Maryland passed legislation that protects children and youth when it comes to testing, allowing them to testify remotely. I am asking that we extend this and allow it to all survivors of all ages. 
Anyone who will experience PTSD or emotional distress are forced to provide testimony, as well as witnesses of violent crimes. No survivor should be forced to face their attacker as they relive their agony. It is horrifying enough to have to recall each minute detail and let alone lock eyes with the person who haunts you, nor to be ridiculed and judged in a room full of people who do not know you. Nationally, suicide is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 24 year olds. Rain reports that 33% of women who are raped contemplate suicide, 13% commit suicide, and 70% experience. I was one of those 33% contemplating taking my own life at 15 years old. The fear of facing my abusers again in person in court is a fear that many should have. By allowing individuals the opportunity to attend their hearing or at least offer testimony via a closed circuit television, we are allowing survivors to feel a sense of security and the opportunity to be surrounded and helped by their loved ones. I am proposing that survivors be allowed access to laptops as well as the proper software in order to testify via closed circuit television. Today, I'm taking the first steps in moving forward as a committee and asking that as technology evolves, so does our system. In the peak of the pandemic, various states and Canada implemented the use of closed circuit trials. They were successful in doing so, and I know it is something that can continue to be applied locally for survivors. In Maryland, I would like to start a pilot program specifically to Montgomery County. So as technology has increased with Bloomberg Law, technology can make the justice system an institution designed to intimidate much more accessible for children and domestic violence victims. According to the word law initiative this year. That was implemented earlier this year and has been something successful in Michigan, is implementing, which I think can be successful here in Maryland. Technology has the ability to further our careers. On TikTok, for the past year and a half, I've been sharing my journey openly as a young black woman in film, as well as a survivor showing other survivors the life that is worth living after a traumatic experience. My videos have over 20 million views and over 105,000 followers. By implementing a program like Wary, it would serve as a boys and girls club for survivors and offer therapy and therapeutic activities to survivors to encourage them to choose life. We would also educate and inform using the Wary informational video module that we've created to be shown in health classes for one week period that offers sexually assaulted students the options and resources to have the proper education of what to do if ever put in this position. Today I am here to speak for the community to help with taking the next steps for both Survivor Screening Act and Mary. According to Montgomery County Media, between 2010 and 2018, the suicide mortality rate increased by 63 percent. This compared to 23 percent statewide and 17 percent in the United States. WTOP reports that Montgomery County remains the largest county in the state of Maryland and continues to show a troubling increase in sexual assaults. As someone who grew up in Montgomery County and after speaking with members of Turnaround, as well as Senator Lee and Mike Laurie, I am positive that Montgomery County is the first um, county for us to start a pilot program. Montgomery County has the resources and finances to allocate a program like this and encourage our neighboring county to do the same. Today, I'm asking you to please hear out this plan and well-conducted research surrounding it. Because in a world of a united front, we prosecute rape, we allow expression, and we remove the fear of moving forward of speaking out. We invoke community, eliminating the number of suicide by survivors. Today, I am taking back the reins and cutting ties with the negative experiences I went through. I am one of the many excelling women who are an example of what you can become when you do not allow your past to define you. I'm asking you to come together and take the next steps in making the Survivor Screening Act and implementing the very module program a reality and allowing survivors to move forward with their lives. I know it is an ambitious goal that may take years to be applied, and that's a fight that I'm ready to be on board for, but I am hopeful and that we can start with the first step of just amending legislation 11304. I recently met with Michael Laurie and Senator Susan Lee to discuss the reality of this. Several jurisdictions have already decided that adult victims of sexual crimes should also be offered the opportunity to testify via live, two-way, closed-circuit television. For reasons similar to those that were offered in Craig to allow remote testimony from child sex crime victims, remote testimony by adult sex crime victims is justified when necessary to promote psychological well-being of the witness. These individuals are particularly vulnerable, suffering in high-rate form post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, and suicidal ideation. 
We believe by amending this particular section and extending it from just minors to every survivor of all kinds, we will be able to decrease the rates of suicide as well as the amount of survivors in distress increase in survivors pursuing charges against their assailants. In a world of vastly changing technology, this, we must choose to move forward and with it any vote change. Today I stand before you at 21 years old and I have accumulated many accolades, but the biggest one of all that I am a survivor who is here to share my story. Thank you. Thank you. So um, you've talked to Senator Lee about this. Um, is she planning to introduce legislation on the, on the yes. matter? Yes. So you're asking us to to support the legislature, or at least what we would do is at, at most is to be able to write in our report, have a, a year-end report that would say that we support that legislation. Um, I guess we can get that legislation from Senator Lee so that we can you know actually take a look at it. Okay. And is that also you said the weary module? Yes. Okay. Am I getting that right? How do you spell that? Is it R Y? We are the text. A R Y. Okay. Now, is that in the legislation, or that's a program? Well, we would need information on that, you know, before being able to consider it. But. Um, I, for one, appreciate your coming in and you know, sharing this with us and uh, your, all your efforts and what you're doing as far as bringing awareness to these issues. Thank you for, yeah. 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 for sharing and standing up and speaking for those who can't. Right. Indeed. And I hope you have that all written down so you can do the same presentation in front of the Senate and the House when it comes to January, February, whenever they have the hearings, you absolutely right. present the same exact speech you just gave us. And if we know about it and we can't, I mean, I'll be there cheering you on if I know if I know when it is. Very good. Thank you very much. Now, uh, the way they have this listed, it's like there are several people, I don't know if they're with you or if there are separate people speaking. Um, Kelly Chen. Okay, you just, you're, okay, so these are your, your support group, Joey Fetterman and Sterling Hampton. They're all they're with you. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, did Evelyn Burton get on? There was no one else that had signed up to speak. She's not on. Okay, did we have anyone that's on online that wanted to speak but didn't sign up and we'll give you an opportunity? Okay, with that, no one there. Um, I, I'd like to take this time, and um, Joe is still here, and we can take pictures when we give you your site. Your citation. Um, Senator Ecker, we'll mail you a citation. Thank your you. Participation. <laughs> okay. And Thank you. Thank you so much. You it's got him right here. Oh, okay. All right. Well, who's first? Mm -hmm. Oh, they have it. Let me put my jacket <laughs> with a pistol here. 